All right. Um, uh, thank you very much to ISIS for, uh, or for organizing the conference. It's uh, definitely been a very interesting event so far. So, I guess without further ado, start off with, um, hold on. Uh, ah, there we go. Start off with, with Ethereum. So, you know, so the Ethereum is the project that I first uh, started about one and a half years ago back at the end of 2013. I was uh, involved in working on Bitcoin and some other blockchain technologies for about two years before that. If uh, any of you ever saw any Bitcoin magazines, um, I was uh, the, the head writer for that for a long period of time. But eventually I sort of realized that this, I, this idea that b behind Bitcoin, but this, this idea of, of sort of using this kind of blockchain that I'll talk about later to create a peer-to-peer -peer digital currency is actually useful for a lot more than, ju than just money. So the, what Ethereum basically is, is it's a sort of platform for building what you call decentralized applications. And what decentralization means, I'll talk about later, but the general principle is it's a way of building applications where, first of all, you don't need, you don't need to have a server. So the application is not run on any one, any one particular computer. It's kind of run by an, by an entire network together. It's start the application and the application keeps on going all on its own. And the key component behind this is this idea of a Turing complete blockchain. A blockchain kind of, it's a, a data structure works kind of the same way that Bitcoin works, except the difference with Ethereum is it has this uh, built-in programming language. And you know, and what a program, programming language does is it sort of gives you full freedom. You know, with, uh, for example, you know, right now we have, we have smartphones. 40 years ago, we, or even like 10 or 20 years ago, we had devi one device for listening, for listening to music, one device for being a calculator, one, you know, one device for, for, for being, uh, like say, a Swiss Army knife. And we had sort of individual devices that did one thing. And, the reason why I started Ethereum is that I was seeing that these sort of blockchain applications, they were working in the same way. So, you know, you had projects like Bitcoin that were meant to just be these kind of peer-to-peer -peer digital currencies. You had systems like Namecoin that were trying to apply the same technology to, do to domain name registration. You had Mastercoin that was trying to do financial contracts. And, you know, with, the point of Ethereum was that, you know, do we really need to build yet an, yet an entire new platform every time someone wants to do like some, di some different thing on top of a blockchain in, in, in a decentralized fashion? And you no, know, the answer is no. Basically for the exact same reason why you don't need to buy a new computer every time you want to download, you want to start using a new program. So, you know, the sort of, so just to sort of understand how many people here have heard of Bitcoin before? Some, okay. How many people have heard of BitTorrent before? Okay. Um, how, how many people have heard of succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge before? <laughs> okay, so the idea behind, so the idea behind uh, systems like BitTorrent and Bitcoin is this concept of decentralization. It's this idea that you have some, an application that's not run by any one com particular computer. Instead, you have this sort of big network of thousands of different, different computers all around the world. And you know, in Bitcoin, you have, uh, you, know, you, have a, you have computers that are helping to run the Bitcoin network from China, from the US, from Europe. So, uh, there's even someone at some point ran a Bitcoin node in North Korea. So you know, it's a sort of completely global system. And it's a system that's not sort of controlled or administered by any one person or, or any one company. So, you know, there is no Bitcoin company that sort of controls Bitcoin that has the ability to, say, reverse transactions, to, say, you know, add, add, create new Bitcoins out of nowhere, to uh, delete people's accounts, or, you know, to, to sort of manipulate the system in any way. It's sort of, it's run in a sort of fashion that's not real, where no one has more power over it than anyone else. And you know, BitTorrent, it runs the same way. It's a sort of large distributed global network with millions of computers worldwide, you know, basically just for people, for people to send files to each other. And 
You know, origin, you know, it's not the first system for, for, for people to share files with each other. Before that, you know, you had Napster, you had uh, a, a, whole bu a whole bunch of different systems. But the unique property of BitSort is this fact that, you know, there is no one company, there's no one person running the whole system. It's kind of run, you know, it, you have these millions of computers around, around the world, and these computers are all talking to each other, and that's it. So... You know, the basic way, the, the basic way that the uh, Bitcoin works is it has a system called a blockchain. So the idea behind a blockchain is that you have this sort of sequence of blocks, and each block contains some list of transactions. So, you know, big, so the idea is that what, what the system is supposed to do is it's supposed to create this kind of digital currency. So, you know, digital currency is also called the Bitcoin. So, you know, I, ha uh, I might have around 200 Bitcoins, someone else might have 100 Bitcoins. You know, they're like, you know, it's like dollars or, or euros or gold. You can, you, you can pass it around. But it, the idea is that, the, you know, unlike other digital currencies, there's no, you know, once again, there's no one server that's kind of controlling who, you know, who has how many coins, how, what transactions get in. The system sort of, ma this is maintained by this kind of blockchain. And you have blocks. Each block contains transactions. One, each transaction might say something like, I want to send 50 Bitcoins to some particular address. And then in order for the transaction to be valid, it needs to be, it needs to be cryptographically signed. So there is a kind of algorithm that you can use to, that you can use to mathematically prove that you, are, that, it's actually, that you actually have the right to, to send those coins. And then you create this transaction, you sign it, you publish this transaction to the network, and then the transaction at some point, if the transaction is valid, it gets into a block. And anyone in the network can produce these blocks. So there's a process by which the entire network kind of works together to produce these blocks, and one new block gets produced every 10 minutes. So you publish this transaction, after 10 minutes this transaction gets into a block, and the entire network ag you know, agrees that this block is valid. And Eventually, sort of more blocks get, built, get, get created after this block, and you have this, this sort of big long chain of blocks. So this is why Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin is called a blockchain. And this blockchain sort of describes the entire history of all transactions that have taken place. So if I want to know how many Bitcoins I have, I can look through the blockchain, I can check um, what all of the transactions are that sent Bitcoins to me, and I can check what all of the transactions are that, that send Bitcoins from my address to someone else, someone else. I can subtract them, and that's how I see how many Bitcoins I have. So, this, the, idea is, so the idea is that any person in, can sort of join the network, and any person can verify for themselves that these blocks are valid. And any person can, you know, any person can check for themselves exactly how many Bitcoins everyone has, how many transa you know, what transactions have been sent, what transactions have not been sent, and so forth. So this, is this, so this sort of concept of a blockchain, it was invented in, uh, in 2009, and this kind of brought the sort of concept of decentralized technology to the next level. Because you, know, you had decentralized systems before that. You had BitSorn in 2004, and these, you know, those kinds of networks are being used in sort of mainstream use cases every day. So, you know, even sort of major gaming companies, they're using sort of BitSort-like networks in order, in order to pass, in order to sort of send updates to their games or, you know, sort of lar large files to, to their users. So, with a blockchain, the difference, the idea is, for the first time, you can have these kinds of decentralized applications that almost kind of work like computers. So they can have their own kind of internal memory. You know, Bitcoin keeps track of how many Bitcoins everyone has. They have an internal memory. They can, they can sort of accept these transactions. They can, uh, you know, people can sort of perform, perform, act, perform actions that, cha that change what the, what the state of these applications is. And, you know, I mean, Bitcoin was really sort of the first application of this. So immediately after it was created, people started, started thinking, you know, what else can we use this for? And in 2010, there was this uh, system called Namecoin, and Namecoin was trying to use this sort of same logic to create a fully a decentralized domain name system. So 
What, do, what are domain name systems? Basically, the idea is that you know, when you go to any website, when you go to, say, google.com, you know, so google.com so google isn't, an, isn't an address that sort of the underlying internet protocol can understand. You know, the internet protocol, it understands these sort of addresses that are called IP addresses. You know, they look like 172.4.58.26 or something. So I, I'm not even sure whose IP address that is, but um, is it yours? <laughs> yeah. So the point is that, you know, there exi and you have Google.com and then you have these IP addresses that look kind of like phone numbers. And, you know, for some reason we were perfectly fine remembering everyone's phone numbers, but now we're not fine remembering everyone's IP addresses. So instead, you, we, what we have is this sort of this big system that's basically a dictionary. You know, it's this big table that's controlled by sort of by this organization called ICANN that basically keeps tr that basically keeps track of what IP address corresponds to say Google.com, what IP address you know cor correspond corresponds to just about every other website. And what Namecoin was trying to do is it was trying to create basically the same thing, but in this sort of completely decentralized form. You know. It's not sort of controlled by any one individual or any one organization. Now, Ethereum, of course, it takes the basic idea and it sort of makes it substantially more complex. And the reason why Ethereum makes it more, makes it more complex is, you know, for the, same re for the same reason why this smartphone is more complex than a Swiss Army knife. So, you know, it's this, Ethereum is it designed that to in this way where it has this sort of built-in program, built programming language and people can create applications inside of Ethereum. So if you want to create something like a currency or something like a domain name system, and I'll give many more examples after this. If you want to, you know, there's, sort of, there's a lot of different things that you, could, that, you could do inside, that you could do inside of Ethereum. So if you want to do one of them, you know, you don't need to create your own sort of system from scratch. You can just write a program and it sort of runs inside Ethereum. So, you know, next question is, so the property that Ethereum brings is this idea of decentralization. You know, this idea that you can have applications that are not run by sort of any one computer. They're kind of just run by the entire, you know, almost the entire internet. And, you know, why is, why is this valuable? So there's, there's, a, there's a few different reasons. I mean, some of them are technological and some of them are, I think, are to some degree political. So, you know, political, and the political reasons are, I think, to some degree what sort of excited, excited people about this early on and, so, you know, the general idea here is that, I mean, there's sort, of two there's sort of two major things that people are concerned with. One thing that people are concerned with is governments having too much power. So, you know, particularly, I am, particularly in sort of, in, say, in a lot of countries in the Middle East, particularly in China, as I understand, to sort of a much, a much lesser but still sort of non-existent extent in, but still sort of exists in extent in Korea and, you know, in a, lot, in a lot of places there are all these sort of concerns about censorship. You know, there's concerns that people are, that, you know, if a government doesn't like some, what some particular website is saying, what some particular application is doing, it's going to try to, it's going to try to shut it down. And, you know, as sort of Satoshi Nakamoto, the founder of Bitcoin said, governments are good at cutting off the heads of a centrally controlled network like Napster, but pure peer-to-peer -peer networks like Nutella and Tor seem to be holding their own. So, you know, the idea is that if there is no one single point of failure, then, it be, then it's a system that becomes much harder to take down. So, this is, sort of, this is sort of one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is basically that it's the corporations that have too much power. So, blockchain technology will, sh will shift the power away from centralized authorities in the field of communications, business, and even politics and law. It enables collective organizations and social institutions to become more fluid and promote greater participation. This was uh, Prima Vera Di Filippi at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society in Harvard. Um, the potential of the blockchain is tied to organizing the world's data in a way that can unshackle society from its dependency on big data behemoths such as Google and Facebook. 
And you know, this other sort of quote that's kind of important here is, in 2012, it made less and less sense to talk about the internet, the PC business, telephone, Silicon Valley, or the media, and much more to just study Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. These big five American vertically organized silos are remaking the world in their image. So, you know, the reason why people are concerned here is because, you know, in the in, before the 1990s, all of these sort of net networks that people were using, radio, you know, sort of tele telephone networks, uh, te television, sort of most of the major media, it was, con it was pretty heavily controlled by a sort of a, a fairly small number of large companies. And these companies were basically setting the, the agenda on, you know, what, what people were seeing. In the 1990s, the sort of original spirit of the internet was actually to try to change that. You know, it was try to, to try to create the sort of system that's ruled not by companies but by protocols. So create this system where sort of everyone can participate on kind of an even level. So on the internet, you know, anyone can use the internet, anyone can look at websites, but anyone can also make a website. So, you know, it's not, it's not that easy to create a TV channel, but if he wants to make a website, you know, it costs about $10. So, and if you're, if you're okay with, you know, having your friends look at your website with an IP address and it costs only one dollar. So, then, in the sort of 20 years after that, you know, we've seen that trend, I think, reversing to some degree. So, you know, the, originally people were, it was all about the internet, it was all about web pages linking to other web pages. And it was nice, it was very open, it sort of really helps the internet grow, but now, it's sort of become, become fairly heavily controlled by these, you know, by Google, Facebook, all of these sort of companies. And a lot of activity doesn't really happen sort of on the internet. It happens inside of the Facebook net. You know, people sort of send, send messages to, that, that ultimately get translated into messages to Facebook, uh, inside of Facebook servers. Then, you know, inside, everything is stored sort of inside of Facebook and, you know, if, you're, if your friends see your messages, that's, that's because they also ask, a fa ask Facebook servers and Facebook servers reply back. And at the end of the day, Facebook sees everything about every, everyone's data. And, they, you know, they keep on changing their privacy policies every few months. So, you know, you can see why there's a problem. So, the idea behind, you know, this, behind decentralization is to sort of Take, you know, create a kind of modern internet that sort of brings back the spirit of the original internet in the, in the 1990s. So, you know, brings back this idea that you, we should have kind of open protocols that sort of anyone can participate in. And, you know, these, theoretically, you know, these kind of open, pro, open protocols can be for, for, a lot, for a lot of different things. So, you know, even, Things like you know domain name registration. That's just one simple example. It could even go into the real world. So you know instead of I mean right now one of the sort of hot economic topics is this idea is Uber and how you know Uber is sort of replacing a lot a lot of taxi companies. But you know can we the what if theoretically we we in instead of having this sort of one company be in be in the middle of everything, we can kind of create an open protocol that lets you know. The, that lets any you know where any driver can participate and passage and passengers can can choose what what drivers to get and the whole thing runs without sort of one group in the middle taking a twenty percent fee, so that's sort of that's part of it. Now the other part is uh, that decentralized systems also just purely from a technical standpoint they can be more reliable. So this is uh, an article that was. Uh, from 2013, 49% of all links cited in Supreme Court decisions are broken. So, you know, what this means is if you look at, you know, if you, you know, it's the 21st century and even the United States Supreme Court sometimes ends up citing the internet. Yay, go internet. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is that if, let's say you have some court decision in 1995 and whatever, you know, Whatever judges, Scalia, Thomas, whatever your favorites are, they you know they're browsing the internet and they see, oh look, here is an old blog article that makes that that, ma that makes uh, you know a, a very good point around around some particular issue or you know raises some important legal argument. It could be a, you know it could be a, a record of some kind of case law. It could be some some information about a previous case. It could be some information pertaining to that specific case, and you know. Okay, it's it's good information, you know, included included in the decision, and you and you know you add in a citation, 
But then, first of all, the person that originally, originally wrote that article might not even know that they got cited by the Supreme Court. And two years, let's say two years later, perhaps, they decide that they're, you know, either they get, they get bored and, or, or lazy and they just decide they're going to shut their blog down, or potentially their blog is hosted by a company and that company decides to go bankrupt. You know, in either case, or, you know, or, or even something else happens, maybe the company decides that, oh, hey, we have a lot of customers now, we're going to start increasing our fees and we're going to charge people a dollar in order, in order to view these blogs. You know, theoretically, anything could happen. And now, the, and now this page is not accessible anymore. So, you know, the reason, and the reason why it happens is because, you know, the sort of continued accessibility of this web page completely depends on this one person and potentially on the sort of chain of many people continuing to store, continuing to hold, to hold that particular web page. So, there is a project, you know, that's uh, not, not directly sort of part of, not, not part of Ethereum, but, uh, you know, it's uh, one that's kind of in the, in the same general space called IPFS. And it's trying to build something that, uh, something that it's calling the permanent web. So the idea there is that instead of referring to, you know, instead of referring to objects, you know, things like pictures, articles, you know, videos, by which server those pictures are stored on, you refer to everything by, by the hash of the file. So by this kind of small sort of number, which is like a cryptographic identifier for what the file's contents actually are. And the idea is that if you, in your browser, you know, you want to access some particular page, it would just ask the entire network, hey, does any computer have the file that corresponds to this hash? And if anyone does, then they send the file back and you can see it. So as long as there is at least one computer in the world that wants to, that's still storing that particular, that particular page, and if the Supreme Court wants to play it safe, the Supreme Court can you know, store all, all of these links, it's, all of these pages itself. It can, run, you know, it can run a server on IPFS as well. Then as long as there is at least one computer, you can still, act, you know, you can still access it. So this, so this is just a, another sort of side of why you know, making these kind of decentralized applications is a good idea. As another point, um, for Ethereum specifically, last year, last year you may have, I don't know, if a few people may have heard there was, this, uh, there was this project called ADEPT. It was a few people inside of IBM who were interested in making a kind of decentralized Internet of Things platform. And the problem with, with IoT is that, you know, the sort of tr traditional kind of Silicon Valley startup approach to doing business is, okay, let's create a platform, let's create an ecosystem, let's grow quickly, let's become a monopoly. And, you know, once everyone starts using it, then, you know, you start monetizing. If you can't monetize directly, then you monetize by having everyone's data and so forth. But, you know, and you, ha and you have companies that try to create these kind of big ecosystems that sort of encompass everything, you know. You know, with Apple, you got your computer, you got your, you got your phone, you got your, you got your music, uh, music player, and, um, you know, with Microsoft, you got email operating system. But, you know, if you try to sort of translate that into the sort of world of hardware, you know, people aren't going to be willing to live in a Samsung house or an Apple house. Um, I mean, no least in part, you because you probably don't want Apple or Samsung data mining your washroom. So... You know, you know, and, you know the, the home is this kind of environment where it's, you're just naturally going to have many manufacturers and those different manufacturers are going to have devices and this is the 21st century, every device will have a computer in it and these computers will just have to talk to each other. Now the question is who runs this platform over which all these devices talk to each other? And the thing is that the, in these, with these devices, in a lot of cases, you know, you want to you, like for a lot of these, uh, for a lot of these devices, people are going to continue using them maybe for ten years, maybe for twenty years. But the company, you know, it might go bankrupt in two years. It might, it might lose interest in the product in three years. And you know, what's going to happen for the other twenty-seven? So, you know, the theory is that if we build these kind of platforms on top of decentralized networks, then you know, they become safer and you don't need to rely on, on any sort of one company continuing to exist in order for them to work. You know, it's just, the idea is that we can potentially create these kind of networks that are, that are guaranteed to last, I mean, potentially even a thousand years. 
So another part of the argument is, of course, you know, this sort of issue of trust. So you know, in general, whenever you use any kind of centralized service, you know, you're, you're sort of fully trusting the company that runs it with your data. And you know, sometimes the, you know, sometimes the company ends up, being, ends up just being, being not that nice and either selling your data or using it for some purpose that you didn't agree. Sometimes the company just gets hacked. And you know, in the sort of security, uh, so right now with the way the internet works, there is this sort of big issue with, uh, cer with certificate authorities. So the problem here is that you know, when you access something like google.com, how do you even know that you're getting a response back from Google server? How do you know that it's actually them instead of, say, some other computer that kind of got in the middle and is pretending to be Google? And the answer is that there, right now we have this system. It's called certificate authorities. It's basically a few of these sort of, uh, it's a sort of large number of agencies all around the world that have the ability to kind of certify a website as being sort of authentic. And the problem with the way the system works right now is you have like 50 of them and your browser trusts all of them. So if someone can hack into any one of these agencies, then they can basically like impersonate a lot of websites. And you know, they can sort of pretend to be someone, something like Google, and you know, users would, would not notice a difference until it's too late. So the, I mean, this is sort of one situation in 2011 where someone from Iran managed to hack into one of the largest certificate authorities in, you know, in something like 15 minutes. And you know, the hack ended up being pretty simple. I think it even got described on YouTube at some point. And you know, because of that, just 15 minutes, some one person in Iran and you know, pe people for a sort of brief period of time had the ability to, to impersonate Google. So, you know, theoretically, with sort of decentralized technologies, you know, you can, you, you, can set, you can set things up in such a way that you don't need to rely on sort of one particular group not to get hacked. You know, you could set up systems where, say, let's say if you use the blockchain to sort of store these certificates, then these certificates would be in this database and, you know, this database would, would sort of be guaranteed to continue working unless basically half of, half of the entire network got hacked at the same time. So that's the kind of promise for this kind of technology for security. Um, so you know, there's been increasing interest uh, in, in Ethereum from, uh, from industry. Um, just a, f a few different examples of this. Um, DNS is, uh, sort of is one example where people are interested. So you know, DNS, DNS is just this one area where sort of right now it's, uh, in, before, uh, before about a year ago, ICANN was kind of heavily controlled by the US and people were concerned about the US having too much power over it. Now I think the US has given up a lot of its power over it and people are concerned that you know, countries other than the US might have too much power. So if we can kind of create a sort of decentralized domain name system, then you know, poten potentially might end up solving a few problems. Um, supply chain tracking is uh, another one. So the idea behind supply chain tracking is that if you have, uh, let's say you have some product, you know, it, could be a, it could be a phone, it could be a bicycle, it could be anything. And let's say you want to know that this product, you know, you know, first of all, let's say you want to know th things about, you know, is this product high quality, uh, is a product high quality, you know, let's say were good environmental standards followed in creating the product and so forth. So the idea with supply chain tracking is that, is that you could imagine if every company at sort of every step of the chain of producing this bicycle would sort of put a record into, the, into this uh, some, you know, a, a blockchain or some, some similar kind of distributed public database. Uh, a record, a, a timestamp rec time stamped record, so a record, you know, it sort of includes a proof of when it was created of when a particular, you know, a particular part was, was finished and you know, when, it was shipped, when it was shipped off to the next part of the chain. And the theory is that if there is anything wrong with the final products, then potentially you could sort of use, use these sort of links in the blockchain that kind of points back to each other and sort of trace it back to where the problem came from. So that's kind of a rough outline of one of these sort of non-financial blockchain applications that people are interested in. Um, one of the largest areas, of course, is still finance. So one of the uh, sort of examples that I sometimes bring up with Ethereum is this, just the idea of crowdfunding. So 
the way crowdfunding generally works is, you know, let's say if you have a lot of people that wants to sort of pool their money together to produce some kind of public good, and it could be a park in a city somewhere, you know, it could be, you know, some, some kind of website, you know, it could be, say, a massive open online course about cryptography, it could be just about anything. Then, with the, the way the sort of crowdfunding model works is people can sort of put their money in, in such a way that, let's say, the person who created the campaign, let's say, wants to raise $10,000 within 30 days. If he actually gets to $10,000, then the $10,000 get released to him. If, however, he does not get $10,000 within 30 days, then the money gets refunded back to everyone. So, you know, so, so the idea is that people can kind of donate money into this pool, but knowing that they're only, um, they're only actually going to be don donating the money if the project gets up to $10,000. You know, if not, then the crowdfund failed and everyone, and everyone gets everything back. So it's a pretty standard model, you know, it's being sort of used with websites like Kickstarter. With Ethereum, theoretically, you know, you could build, it's actually, and it's actually not that difficult, you could build exactly that kind of crowdfunding logic without needing any particular person to, to run the process. So the idea is that, you know, instead of sending their money to some kind of intermediary, people can sort of send their money directly to a program. And the program itself has this logic that if it gets to $10,000 within 30 days, then the program automatically passes it along to whoever the recipient was. If it doesn't, then the program hands all the money back. And this program is run in this decentralized Ethereum network, and you know, there's, no, there's no one particular person who, who's kind of in charge of the program. You know, there's, no, there's no particular person that you need to trust to enforce that particular piece of logic. So that's... And you know, theoretically, you could sort of push this model further. So one idea that some people are interested in is this uh, concept of distributed organizations. So, one ex so just one simple example is, take this crowdfunding model. Now, let's say that if this pool gets to $10,000, then everyone who participated has, you know, basically automatically gets sort of democratic control over how the funds are spent. So now you don't need one person to manage the process at all. And, you know, in a, lot of case, in a lot of cases, that's valuable, you know, I think, especially in, like, sort of international contexts where you, first of all, you, you often don't have a, even, a, even a legal system as a kind of substitute to, to sort of provide a, provide a kind of level of trust. And, you know, if, if it's sort of international, people don't even have a, don't really have a common payment system. They, and, you know, if, if it can be hard for people to work together just sort of, just because of that, then you know Ethereum provides this kind of cryptographic platform that just makes that kind that kind of cooperation a lot easier. So that's so that's one example. You know, there's actually a company in Singapore called called Autonomous that's basically trying to do that. They're trying to create a product that kind of makes it easier for people to basically create companies that are kind of that kind of have assets that are sort of controlled directly by a program on the Ethereum, on the Ethereum blockchain. And you know, the theory is you can create one of these companies, and you know, you would sort of vote on you know on how the money gets spent, sort of on the blockchain directly. So, you know, people have called this sort of people have sometimes call this idea crypto law. You know, the idea of sort of using using blockchains to kind of enforce contracts directly. Now, of course, you know, the idea has limits. There are things, you know, there are things that blockchains can't do. So, for example, a blockchain by itself. Has, has no idea, you know, whether or not a, a particular house actually burns down. So, you know, creating, doing sort of insurance on the blockchain is not, is not as easy as, you know, just writing a script that says, you know, if house burns down, then send $200,000 to this particular address. But, and particularly, of course, uh, the blockchain can definitely can't, can't tell whether, the, whether or not, say, the person burned his own house down because, because he, want, he just wants to get the money out of the insurance company. So, you know, there are these kind of difficulties that you have to work around, but, you know, in some cases, this sort of automatic, digi automatic sort of digitally enforced system by which programs kind of directly control money, you know, can work pretty well. And in some cases, it works less well. So, you know, as I was saying, sort of before Ethereum, you know, you know, I definitely didn't invent the, the, the idea that you can have programs that are sort of controlled by multiple computers. So, you know, people were doing that, before, you know, with Bitcoin for four years, with BitTorrent for 10 years, in general for 30 years. But, 
you know, the problem is that most, you know, most of the projects that we're, that we're trying to do is sort of decentralized X. And it could be decentralized DNS, it could be decentralized Uber, it could be, you know, decent, could be, you know, sort of decentralized certificate authorities, and just about anything. So the problem is that all these projects were spending 90% of their effort on decentralizing and 10% of their effort on, you know, the thing that they were, the actual product that they were trying to build. So, you know, the point, the sort of idea behind Ethereum is that kind of, you know, it's the platform that tries to sort of, you know, sort of be the Android of the decentralized world to some degree. Sort of make it easy to build applications that work in this particular way because sort of we do the hard parts ourselves and we try to kind of, you know, expose the kind of interface that makes these decentralized applications look just like, what, just like regular websites. So, you know, that's the sort of, I mean, from the point of view of a developer and from the point of view of a, of a user, that's kind of what we're, what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. So, you know, basically, you know, there's always stuff that if you're building an application, there's always stuff that you need to worry about. Stuff like, you know, building the application logic, building the interface, marketing, legal, and so forth. But, you know, the goal of Ethereum is that we sort of worry about all this other stuff that people that were trying to build peer-to-peer -peer applications before sort of all, ha all had to do from scratch each and every time. So, you know, the, so the point is that, you know, something like a decentralized do domain name system, like the sort of core application logic is really just about 10 lines of code. Basically, all you need is just sort of one function for reserving a domain and then one function for setting the IP address of a domain. It's just 10 lines of code. This is sort of just the 10 lines of Ethereum code. You can take this exact code, compile it, put it on the Ethereum blockchain, and you have a domain name system. So the point is to try, you know, to, try to make it that easy. So, you know, people are developing applications on this right, right now. So, one interesting example of, of, of something that's being built right now is a sort of dig, digital prediction market. So, the idea behind prediction markets is that people basically bet on, you know, outcomes of particular events. So, if, let's say, I think Donald, you know, let's say you have a token, and, let's, and you know, that token, let's say, pay, just pays out $1, if Donald Trump wins the 2016 US presidential election and pays zero dollars if someone else does. Now let's say I think that I, re I am really confident that Donald Trump is actually going to win, you know, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to buy some of these tokens and, you know, if at some, point I realize, at some point I realize, hey, Donald Trump might not actually win, then, then you know, I'll sell these tokens. And the theory is that the sort of market price of these tokens between zero and one dollar kind of actually reflects the probability that the market thinks Donald Trump is actually going to win the election. So the idea is it's sort of simultaneously kind of, a way, you know, for the users, it's kind of a way for people to sort of bet, you know, bet on, uh, sort of real world events and you know if they have some pri if they have some private knowledge then maybe then maybe get some profit off of that and for society it's kind of a nice way of getting you know sort of what the market thinks are probabilities that various different things are going to happen and you know potentially that could I mean, satisfy users curiosity sort of help businesses nonprofits and governments sort of plan for the future and so forth so there's a project called Augur that's trying to create this kind of prediction market on top of ethereum now you know, why hasn't someone created a prediction market on, to, on top of a website? Well, a couple of reasons. I mean, so one thing that Ethereum offers is, you know, blockchains and sort of cryptocurrency systems, they're inherently extremely global. So they, you know, someone from, people from the US can participate, people from Europe can participate, people from Zimbabwe can participate. Um, another point is also that there, you know, there actually was quite a bit of sort of, censorship of prediction markets going on. So there's sort of one famous incident where, you, where someone set up a prediction market to try to predict the ratings of Hollywood movies. And you know, at some point it was actually sort of, it was actually showing that some, you know, a few particular Hollywood movies are, very, are likely to have very bad ratings. And people are looking at these, mar uh, people are looking at these markets and people are actually seeing, you know, hey, maybe I shouldn't actually visit, go to this movie at all. So, you know, they were sort of actually starting to sort of protect consumers from bad movies before the fact. And Hollywood got angry about that and, you know, they lobbied and they, and they passed an amendment to the Dodd-Frank Dodd Act, basically prohibiting, you know, prediction, prediction markets on, on movies. So that's, 
sort of, you know, with these kind of decentralized systems, you know, basically it's sort of, it's sort of much harder to prevent people from participating, participating in them to some extent. So that's, and, you know, also particularly, you know, in this kind of system, sort of, yeah, nobody, no particular person is sort of running the market. There, there's actually not even one particular person that's kind of providing the information of, you know, what events actually happened after the fact. So the way Augur is designed is that kind of everyone at the, everyone in the entire system at the end kind of votes on, votes sort of on what the truth is. So, you know, it's sort of designed to be extremely distributed from the start. So that's, uh, Another example is uh, sort of Wayfund. It's you know a crowdfunding. Pro it's basically a crowdfunding project. That's kind of the original vision was to basically kind of be Kickstarter on top of Ethereum. But right now, the creator of Wayfund is also doing this thing called Boardroom, which is basically the sort of distributed company thing. So the idea is that people can sort of crowdfund directly into kind of you know it could be a, you know it could be a company, it could even be a, it could be a nonprofit organization, it could be anything. You know, it basically is what the participants want it to be. It's sort of crowdfund into a pool, and then that pool sort of automatically, right from the start, has rules on what the money can be spent for and how, and. You know, theory is that this could be sort of this could be this kind of new form of organization that makes it much easier for people. I mean, both to do businesses and you know, even for sort of nonprofit organizations and charities as well. So you know, if you imagine sort of you know, sort of charity, you know, if you imagine sort of single project charities that kind of get quickly crowd quickly crowdfunded on Wayfund and then kind of immediately sort of start spending money and the whole process of how it's governed is kind of completely transparent. Then you can kind of see what the possibilities are. Um, provenance is actually one example of this sort of supply chain tracking project. So they're specifically targeting the sort of consumer side, this idea of kind of helping people see where the pr products, are, where the products that they're using came from. So, you know, help people see, you know, does, the, does this particular product follow good environmental standards? Is it high quality and so forth? So the nice thing actually about Providence is that I think that in one of the thing is that a lot of these sort of decentralized projects, they end up sort of saying, oh, look, we know, about, hey, uh, you know, we know, we know math and cryptography and we know about blockchains. It's cool technology. Now, what can we use it for? And eventually they realize, oh, look, this DNS thing seems like a good idea. Yeah, I don't know anything about DNS, but I'll start doing it. Providence, I mean, the reason why I like it is because it actually followed the opposite path. They were, they were running, you know, they even started, they were developing for an entire year, even before they discovered Ethereum. And they saw that, you know, Ethereum is a, seems like an actually good platform to do this kind of stuff, you know, in a sort of extremely transparent and public way. And, you know, right now they're developing Providence as an application. So, you know, that's, those are just only three of the projects. So there's, you know, a whole lot more. There's about, I think about 65 applications on this kind of list that some community members have created. So, you know, it's really sort of moving forward. Um, excited to announce that finally, after one and a half years, Ethereum has actually launched. So yay, it officially exists as of six days ago. Um, <laughs> Now, there's a sort of long road, there's a sort of long development roadmap ahead. So, you know, there's, there's still a lot of challenges that we have to do. So, for example, this, uh, this wonderful little, little interface, it's, you know, it's, it's not really finished yet. So, we're trying to get this to the point where, I mean, first of all, it's extremely easy for people to use. And second, it's easy for people to use securely. So, you know, we're trying to sort of help people find some, because the thing is, these sort of trust-free applications, all the sort of crazy cryptography in the world doesn't really matter if someone can just create an interface where, where you know, where, where the button that says search is actually a button to send all, to send all your money to me. So that's, uh, so dealing with those kind of sort of more subtle security issues, that's something that we, you know, we're going to be dealing with very heavily over, over the next six months or so. Um, security. Um, eventually, we're planning on sort of tackling scalability and, you know, just a whole bunch of technical issues to try to sort of make this as easy to use as possible. You know, there's quite a lot of work to do. Um, so, favorite part of the project is that I think that Ethereum is, it, it managed to be, manages to be extreme, extremely global. So, you know, we, we always talk a lot about how blockchains are as kind of global things and, you know, people can use them whether they're in Africa, Asia, you know, Asia, North or South America. And, you know, it doesn't, you know, sort of don't discriminate by nationality at all. And, 
you know, with Ethereum, you know, it's actually true. So this is a sort of world map of just some of the Ethereum nodes that, we're on, that are online right now. And you, know, you see North America, you see South America, Australia, Europe, Asia, even one in Africa. Unfortunately, we don't have anyone in Antarctica yet, but if you want to set up a node, we'll be very grateful. So, yeah, so I'm uh, definitely, definitely looking forward to seeing that node in Antarctica. And uh, thank you.